Well, what is going on, ladies and gentlemen? It's your boy, Jay Spence the King, and I am not with my brother. I am not with, well, actually, I am with my brother, but I'm not with Joe Miller, the buttery, smooth voice that you're used to hearing. Today, I am joined by a very special guest. I say special for me because it's always a treat when I get to hang with my guy, Bruce Nolan. What's up, Mr. Bruce Exclusive? Dude, it's a party all the time. Disco balls, dancers, the whole thing. I'm just happy to be here. I'm happy that I was viewed as being a reasonable facsimile for the one, the only, the voice, Joe, Mil Joe Miller, and I'm happy to be here. I'm going to tell you, honest to God, I laugh every single time you say, dude, it's a party. Um, like every single time. It's like, but I'm grateful that you were able to do this with me, man, because um, listen, doing, doing these hump days by myself or doing these hump days with people who I don't really have the same chemistry with is not as fun. So no, I absolutely appreciate you doing this. And um, I know you, now you typically pre-record, you don't do your, your other show live, right? So that's, that's tomorrow. Did you already do your show for tomorrow? Yes. So uh, this evening I have already recorded the Bruce exclusive. I have set up and put the outline in place for food for thought. And now I'm doing this show. So I already See. did all that stuff. I got to I got to get like way more organized to be like anywhere near <laughs> you you just you're just always on point. So it's organization by necessity, because if not, my entire life would come completely off the rails. And at that point, people would go, hey, guys, you remember <laughs> that Bruce Nolan guy? Like he went crazy and started running down the street in his underwear, screaming something about dogs being better than people. Like he had a psychotic break and they had to put him in like a in a facility of some sort. That's what would happen <laughs> if I wasn't the level of organized I am. Well, I'll tell you what, like you, you did an elbow reveal earlier, but you, you would, um, you would be revealing a whole lot more than a, than a noodle on that one. <laughs> or would I be recording a noodle? <laughs> <laughs> oh Lord. Okay. Let's, we're, we're already starting off the rails. Let's see. We got Daniel in the building. What's up, Daniel? Thanks for joining us tonight. What's up, Jeffrey? We appreciate you kicking it with us. And I, I know I saw Richard Rush. Um, tweet out how excited he was to have the hump day hotline happening with my man, Bruce exclusive, Mr. Bruce Nolan. Uh, so we're going to get right into the topics. We're going to get right into it. Um, first, you know how the hump day goes. We always talk about the game from this past Sunday, then we move forward to the next. So before we even start to even look forward to the, the, the New Jersey jets, um, we had a disappointing law Sunday, Bruce. I, I, well, I don't know if I want to call it disappointing or heartbreaking, <laughs> you know, but it was a disappointing loss. First, I mean, what are your takeaways here, man? Are we still a playoff team? Is it still like, you know, is, is this the, are we burning and crashing now or, or what's happening? I don't think we're crashing and burning now. I don't, I don't think that's the case at all. I think that really it's, it's just one game and I know it's a disappointing game and for some it might be heartbreaking. I, I don't really ever find myself heartbroken by my favorite team, not winning a game. That seems a little too strong for me, but disappointing seems reasonable to me, but lots of Super Bowl teams had disappointing games. I'll never forget last year that after the Tampa Bay Buccaneers lost and lost badly to the skeletal remains of Drew Brees and the New Orleans Saints, I think the final score was 38 to three. The question was, well, father time's undefeated. That's it. Tom Brady, it catches up to the best of them. I don't know what to tell you guys. They're seven and five. They go on to win the Super Bowl. Eh, stuff happens. I'm not yeah. saying that this team is going to win the Super Bowl. I'm saying that every great story has a climax. Every great story has a disappointment. Every great story has a villain and a despair. Every great trilogy has an empire strikes back, right? Mm -hmm. The movie where at the end of Empire Strikes Back, everyone's looking around going, really? That's how it's going to end? <laughs> As if somehow the title didn't give it away. The Empire Strikes Back. As if somehow we're surprised now right. that <laughs> Luke has no hand. Han got captured by Boba Fett and Darth Vader. And he's encased in carbonite. Like, this is Empire Strikes Back. You might as well just call the episode Empire Strikes Back 2021 Buffalo Bills. It doesn't really matter how the middle goes. It matters how the end goes. You know what? So so for those of you listening in podcast form, you will see it. This will be called The Empire Strikes Back because that's what I'm looking forward to seeing the Bills do Sunday. Uh, but we're not there yet. But I'm going to name this episode Empire Strikes Back because Bruce just inspired me. So but but you're right. I agree with you. I've been saying 
you know, um, so there's a couple things. I, I've been seeing a bunch of overreactions, a bunch of overreactions. So some people are like, you know what? Uh, I just expected us to beat the bad teams and we lost to Pittsburgh and we lost to now the Jaguars. Here's the thing. First, I think Pittsburgh is showing us that they're not as bad as we thought. Now, I don't think they're good, but they're not as bad as we thought. And also, obviously, Tennessee, I feel like at this current moment, I would rank them the first first or second best team in the AFC, just depending on what type of conversation you want to have. Um, I'm, I'm very, very, and we can talk about this later on if you'd like, but I'm very, um, I just, I can't quite put my finger on why Lamar Jackson is so successful. So it's tough for me to kind of bet against the Ravens with the way they're performing and they're doing more with less. I feel like every year, especially this year with this guys being on IR, there's just an like an overabundance of amazing play from Lamar Jackson. So I can't count him out. But the Tennessee Titans, same thing. Derrick Henry goes, goes down and everybody's like, oh, oh they're going to get destroyed Sunday. Now Henry's down and they got to rely on Tannehill. They win again. They just keep winning. So, um, you know, I guess for me, I look at the losses that we have. And yes, this one's disappointing. This one is obviously disappointing. You don't, first of all, you, you always anticipate scoring a touchdown against the worst team um, worst or second worst team in the league. And you all, obviously we all thought we were going to blow them out last uh, Saturday on the chop up. We did the show live at, at resurgence and everybody gave their takes and everybody's like, look, we're going to blow this team out. Nate's like, it's going to be a 50 burger. And then we had like, we had everybody talking. It didn't look anything like that, but I agree with you. Every, every season, whether you're the champion or not, has your highs and has your lows. And I think, it sounds like to me, even Coach McDermott, this sounds like the low of lows for the season, and I don't anticipate us having another moment like this. Uh, did you get a chance to catch Coach McDermott's presser? I did. And what were your thoughts? Like, just the way um, – because to me, there's a certain energy this season that I've gotten from McDermott that – I'm sorry, did McDiddy – that has been kind of – I can't I can't call him McDermott. He's McDiddy to me. I got to do it. But um, he's been he's been very fun this year. I feel like he's been – a little bit lighter of a personality and you know, he smiles, he tells jokes and he does all these different things, but today felt different. Um, give me your insight on what you kind of picked up, you know, from, from this presser from coach McDiddy. People are using a lot of different words to describe the team's mood so far this week. Um, more muted was a word that mm -hmm. I heard. Um, le a little less jovial, perhaps business-like mm -hmm. is something yeah. people use. I want to throw another one at you. Resolve. I feel like there's an opportunity when you have a loss like this. There's an opportunity for galvanization. Sometimes galvanization can come after a loss. And ideally, it can come after a win where you didn't perform. And that's one of the things that great teams can do is take the same energy that you would historically get from an embarrassing or humility loss and apply it in the circumstances where you actually won a game, but you weren't performing up to your level where you win a game and you hear people say, we got a lot of stuff to work on. That mm -hmm. same energy can be achieved after a win. It's just a lot easier after a loss. And really what you want to see is you don't want to see the team fundamentally change who they are. But I think the right. word resolve comes into play here. It's being resolved. It's a hyper focus level. It's a refocus level. And of course, the natural extension of that statement is, well, why weren't they focused before? And it's part of human emotion that you can't be 100% all the time. You just can't. Every single person you know has walked into work one day and they just weren't feeling it. Mm -hmm. The energy was weird. Your coworkers were weird. You just couldn't get on the same page. You've had it with your spouse. Every single person wakes up and they're just like, it just doesn't feel the same today. We need to we need to get back on the same page. We need to refocus. That wasn't because you weren't taking your marriage seriously. It wasn't because you weren't taking your job seriously. Stuff just happens. You can't be 100% locked in all the time. The NFL, as short of a season as people say it is, and ironically enough, it's now one week longer, and we can talk about the idiocy of extending the NFL football season later, but... It's still a long year and it's mentally and physically draining. And you're going to have moments, especially when your bye week is early. I hate early bye weeks, but especially when your bye week is early, there's an opportunity where instead of that bye week being respite, 
that bye week is almost like a getting you out of your groove sort of scenario. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's not concerning overly until it persists. Something is a problem if it persists. If you wake up one day and you got a zit on your forehead, you got a zit on your forehead. If you wake up every single day and you got a zit on your forehead, now you have acne. Now you should call a dermatologist, yep. right? <laughs> Something is a problem when it persists. And so as disappointing as this loss was, I think resolve is the appropriate emotional reaction. And I think that was my takeaway from Sean McDermott's press conference. Well, uh, Cam Greasy in the comments says that uh, this feeling or the feeling this week almost reminds them of how it felt after the Arizona loss last year. And I agree to an extent because of the kind of what you said, the resolve and, and the um, business like mentality and everything that we've been seeing and hearing from the team this week. But I guess I guess for me, I don't know. Like, OK, so, yeah, you're right. If If you start to see these things all the time, it becomes a habit and it becomes a problem. I, I'm not as concerned as a lot of things that I saw, but I'm concerned. And I'll tell you why I'm concerned. So um, last night I was supposed to have uh, Carlos Williams on the code of conduct. He's going to reschedule. He had some family things going on, so we're going to reschedule. But a lot of things I wanted to talk to him about, um, it sounds like Coach McDermott, Josh Allen, Brian, like it sounds like everybody talked about the stuff I wanted to talk about last night. So I kind of want to, I want to reshift and refocus it, not in the same way I wanted to talk to Carlos, but I kind of want to ask you some of those same questions because it, it seems like there's, there's enough blame to go around. We can, we can blame Brian Dayball if you want to take the angle of, well, the play calling has to be better on offense. I don't quite agree with that take, but that's one take that I saw. Then it's like, oh, we got to blame McDermott because he didn't put his players in the right position or the game plan going into the game wasn't OK. I disagree there as well. I've seen people blame Josh. I've seen people blame the offensive line. I've seen people blame the running attack. Let, let's let's for a moment, let's kind of take it all back and let's figure out, at least from your perspective, I want your opinion on this, Bruce. Where do you think where do you think the blame lies? Is it with? Uh, the coordinators? Is it with the coaching? Is it with the the offensive line exclusively? Is it with the running backs? Like, what what do you see as the issue here? Despite my Twitter handle, nothing is ever really exclusively someone's problem. It's never really exclusively the offensive line or exclusively the running backs. I think that sometimes we just we just want a scapegoat. It's that simple. But the fact of the matter is, it's never that simple. It's never ever ever that simple ever it's just it's never going to be that simple football is an incredibly complicated team sport it's never going to be simple there's all these different systems that rely upon each other and overlap with each other and it's never going to be that simple so you can ask me to rank them and if i were to rank them i would say offensive line josh allen dable in that order when it comes to the offense when it talks to the running game i go offensive line Dable running backs in that order. Okay. If you're just talking about it, but offensive line is going to be the number one thing for me because it's been proven time in and time out that if you get a good offensive scheme and you get good offensive linemen, you can make a lot of running backs successful. Kyle Shanahan and his father have been doing it for 4 million years. They traded up in the third round, drafted Trey Sermon, and suddenly he's the third best player on their team. Why? Because they found Elijah Messel and Jamar Marcus Hasey to Michael Hasty, goodness gracious, I can talk. And all of these players just come in with one or two reasonable traits that they say fit with this. They can plant their foot, they can hit the ball, and they can go. And so for me, when I look at offensive line, it's always going to start there. Always going to start there. If you improve your offensive line, you improve multiple things about your team. You improve your quarterback, you improve the amount of yeah, route concepts you can run, you improve your running game, all this stuff. Now, I'm not saying that these are elite level running backs. What I'm saying is they're passable if the rest of, things, rest of the things are good. Guess what? Mm -hmm. The rest of the things aren't good. So they're not passable. The reason why you don't look at Devin Singletary and Zach Moss and think they're reasonable running backs is because in order for them to achieve reasonable, the offensive line has to be reasonable. And the offensive line, I think, is below reasonable right now. So for me, it's going to start up front. And so I think there are things that can be done on the Dable side, but I think the things that you can do are limited 
by the fact that you don't have the horses. There is no game plan for my guards aren't playing well. That's not a thing. Well, I'll just pull out the my guards aren't playing well file file of my playbook here. Excuse me, if you go to, excuse me, page 37, subsection <laughs> B, line 7, paragraph A, if you'll see the clause here, it clearly states that what we are going to do is we're going to run this one play, spider 2 Y banana, and it's going to be fine. Like, that's not how this works. So you can only cook with the ingredients you have. You can only cook with the ingredients you have. And Brian Dable has eh, ingredients. And so you're getting eh, from the offensive line and the running game. Well, let me, um, I don't want to cut you off, but let me cut you off for a quick moment because Pam actually has, has a, a good question. She says, uh, we were doing well up until the Miami game. Is it because of the two offensive line players that were out, uh, meaning John Feliciano and Spencer Brown? Is Do you think missing those two guys are the reason that this line isn't playing well or is it is it something else? Is it scheme? What's, what's the issue with the offensive line? I don't think the Bills were playing up well overall up until the Miami game. I think the premise there is something I'd probably disagree with because Week one, we had a discussion post week one as to whether or not it was too early to panic on the offensive line and everyone was healthy and it was the first week. Mm -hmm. So if you think about the Steelers game didn't go well and the Jaguars game didn't go well. And I think that the games that went a little bit better from the offensive line didn't go great in run blocking at all. I think we had one really big run against Miami with Devin Singletary that had a chance to kind of usurp a lot of those numbers and make them look like they were a little bit better than they actually are. And aside from that, you had a lot of Josh Allen making the offensive line look better. Josh Allen's pressure to sack ratio was absolutely absurd this year mm. because the defenses were not converting pressures to sacks against him. Oh, they were getting pressure. They were always getting pressure on Josh Allen, but they weren't converting him into sacks. He was making the offensive line look better than they actually were. So I don't think the offensive line suddenly became bad against the Jaguars. I don't think they've ever been good as far as this year goes. They've been middling. And with middling offensive lines, you're going to get good performances and you're going to get bad performances. And this was one that wasn't good. It's just disappointing because so like one of the things that I, one of the, actual little notes that i have here so the bills um outside of josh so you take josh's stats outside of it the bills had nine rushes for 22 yards sunday um and that that's an average of 2.4 yards per carry you add josh's numbers in there and that jumps up to 5.14 yards per carry um first i'm agreeing with you about the offensive line and, and just to kind of back pedal on a comment that you made a, a little bit ago you may mention that you need a above average or a good offensive line and a and a good running back or you know to make your running backs look good and you and you mentioned Shanahan and his father doing the same thing I've been on this train uh going back into last season saying that you know a we need to run the ball better we need to run the and not necessarily more I think I think the amount of times not Sunday Sunday we didn't really run much but uh the amount of times that the Buffalo Bills choose to choose to run the football I feel like it's 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 a good balance for the type of offense you want to have but I just think the the efficiency has to improve man so like that 2.4 yards per carry I think Again, I'm agreeing with you because I feel like you either, A, if you're going to have Devin Singletary and Zach Moss, then you better have a damn good offensive line, like a very good offensive line. And that's not to say that Devin Singletary and Zach Moss aren't able and capable running backs, but it's very clear that they're not Christian McCaffrey and Derrick Henry. It's very clear that they're not Delvin Cook and LaShawn McCoy. So if you're going to have running backs that don't have the elite talent, then I feel like you have to have some elite talent on your offensive line. Am I wrong when I say that? Like, am I am I being crazy or am I just, you know, out here thinking? Um, yeah, Because in my mind, you have to have that. You have to. No, they're inversely proportional traits. You're absolutely right. It's a little bit like anticipation and arm strength for a quarterback, which is the more of one you have, the less of the other you need. So we talk about this when we talk about quarterbacks all the time. And that is the more anticipatory you are as a quarterback, the less of a hose you need. Because it's about time. And if you have a significant hose, if you have a really strong arm, you need less anticipatory traits to be able to pull off the same level of throws. This is why Matt Barkley has to be more of an anticipator than Josh Allen. 
Josh Allen was a see the ball, throw the ball kind of guy. He was a see the open man, throw it. Guess what? You can get away with it when you have a howitzer attached to your right shoulder. If you have Matt Barkley's arm, then you can't pull that off. It's the same way with offensive lines and running backs. The less of one you have, the more of the other you need. There are some running backs who can perform okay behind terrible offensive lines. Now, they're never going to meet their absolute potential, but Barry Sanders never had really, really, really good offensive lines. Now, obviously, we're using one of the greatest players in NFL history as this example, but it's far easier to find players to run behind a good offensive line than it is to find elite players who are capable of running behind terrible offensive lines, which is why one always predicts the other. It's not a chicken and the egg scenario. People think it is. Now, they are inversely proportional, like we talked about, but they're not chicken and egg. One of them has been proven over and over again to correlate more significantly to rushing success than the other. It's easier to find good offensive linemen than it is to find an elite running back who's so good he doesn't even need good offensive linemen. So you're absolutely true. These two things are connected. It's almost like a seesaw. You know, it's like it's like market systems and interest rates and bonds and things like that. Something goes up, something goes down. That's the way it works. They're inversely proportional. And right now, both sides of the seesaw are down for the Buffalo Bills. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and because of that, it's uh, it's really concerning because the, the offense that we saw last season, it's like, OK, Josh is out here. He's flinging. He's throwing for 350 yards a game and he's getting every teams. I'm not saying they figured the offensive out, the offense out, but they're figuring like they're, they're learning how to slow certain things down or take certain things away. So that way we have to depend on other things like the run game. So without that line is going to be really, really ugly. Uh, Charlie gave us a super, super chat here. Thank you, Charlie. Shout out to my man, Charlie over there. Um, representing that built in Buffalo network. Uh, but he says this leads us into a deeper discussion on why Brandon Bean and his, and his ability and unwillingness to get a better offensive line. Obviously agree. Josh masked the offensive line and bring and Brandon Bean and McDiddy either didn't see it or thought that it would continue. Uh, what are your thoughts on Charlie's comment here? I think the assumption of improvement is what we ran into here. I think that the assumption of improvement applied to Cody Ford and it applied to John Feliciano. The Buffalo Bills drafted offensive linemen. They just drafted tackles. Why would they draft tackles when John Feliciano and Cody Ford were your starting guards? Because the assumption of improvement was there. John Feliciano was healthy. Now, he also reported markedly lower weight and the bills were surprised by the weight that he lost that the team did not ask him to lose. So they assumed that a healthy John Feliciano would be better. They assumed that Cody Ford would be better now that he is stable at his guard position. It's this idea that we always assume young players are going to get better. We always assume players are going to get better because of health. We always assume these things and it just doesn't work out like that. Some players plateau. This idea that we always assume, well, he'll be better second year in the system. He'll be so much better. He might. Oh, he'll be better. He's going to be healthy now. He'll be better. He might. Maybe. Or we always maybe use these is. things because this is part of off-season narrative. Off-season yeah. narrative is finding a positive spin to put on literally everything. Pam in the comments flat, flat out says, it's funny, three weeks ago, Big, Bean and McDermott were gods. Do you remember all of the people this off-season? who flat out said, oh, so you think you know more than the team? The second everybody was like, really? We doubled down on defensive ends? No no corner, no no offensive lineman, no no interior, no guard or anything? We're really going to go in with Feliciano and Ford and just kind of hope? Greg Tom said, yeah. cover one, famously, says hope is not a plan. Well, assumptiveness is almost kind of hope. It's just a stronger version of it. And I think that's what we ran into. When it comes to the guard play, I think we ran into the assumptiveness that goes along with assuming improvement. And we assume Feliciano would be better when he was healthy. We assumed Cody Ford would be better in this now that he's a stable guard. And that just didn't happen. And so when you assume that you're going to get a level of play from people and you don't get it and you make no significant effort to hedge against the failure to improve, this is what happens. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we can we can kind of move 
forward from this uh depressing conversation well you know you know <laughs> before we move forward from this though before before we move to the next game um there is we, we talked about the offense i do want to say that even though it was a, a a game that a lot of us want to forget the defense still showed up and they did amazing things to only give up nine points um i know the offense isn't considered a juggernaut down there in in jacksonville but i'm gonna tell you what anybody who watches it knows Trevor Lawrence has a very, very good arm, and he makes about five or six or sometimes more, depending on the game. He makes certain plays every single game that's like, whoa, that guy's going to be good. And he has a couple weapons. And the Buffalo Bills did everything that they had to do to shut him down. Micah Hyde, to me, um, very close. I would say Micah Hyde was probably the MVP of the defensive game. If not Micah Hyde, I'm, I'm going to go with Jordan Poyer. But I, I feel like, first of all, the safeties – by any and all means necessary need to be pro bowlers this year. I'm still on my Jordan Poyer for all pro or our riot um, campaign this year. Um, how did, what was your takeaway from the defense this week? I know it's probably very consistent with the rest of the year, but uh, how, how did you view the defense? It wasn't surprising to me. This defense has shut down bad offenses and the Jaguars are not a good offense. So yeah. the fact that the defense shut down the Jaguars is what we would expect them to do because that's what they've historically done. The time when the defense let the tip, the team down was three quarters against the Titans where they couldn't stop anybody. And they did a pretty good job against the chiefs. But now looking back at that, the chiefs are struggling with turning the ball over. So this team has been tested by a good offense for maybe one and a half games and mm -hmm. three quarters of one game. They didn't rise to the challenge. So, but beating up on bad teams, that's always been something McDermott's defense could do. Very rarely have we seen a McDermott defense really let us down against a bad offense. It's just not something that happens often. The offense lays stinkers against defenses they shouldn't more often than the defense lays stinkers against offenses that they shouldn't. We can always count on Sean McDermott's defense to take advantage of bad quarterback play and bad offenses. So I would be more shocked quite frankly, if the defense didn't show up, then I was by the offense not showing up. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I just thought they looked good, man, um, the entire time. But flip side, the other Josh Allen had a day. Um, he was named defensive player of the week uh, for the AFC. And and I know, obviously, this show is is, is pro bills. But, hey, I got to give some flowers where they're due, man. He, he showed up and he absolutely he absolutely had a day. What did he have a sack? He had a. a force fumble or interception like it's like he was basically on every stat um takeaways from josh and then we can then we can move forward to this game coming up with the uh, new jersey giants uh new, new jersey jets i'm sorry i think this is the kind of player that you wanted when you draft and end in the top 10 and the jaguars have had so many misses in the first mm -hmm. round i mean just so many misses if you look at the jaguars list of first round picks it has never been it has never been fun to look at that list because you think about all the missed opportunities. How many times were they picking in the top five? I mean, if you look through their list, just let's just go through. Okay. Travis Etienne out for the year, broke his foot. Trevor Lawrence. He's a rookie. He's doing rookie things. Okay. Kalevon chase on has been a dis disappointment. CJ Henderson got traded already. Josh mm -hmm. Allen's been great. Taven Bryan had one good game and it was against the bills, which is one of the reasons why it was so embarrassing. <laughs> Otherwise he's been a disappointment. Leonard Fournette was not a great player for the Jags when he was there. He was okay. He was all right. Jalen Ramsey got traded away. Dante Fowler disappointment. Blake Bortles bust Luke Jokel disappointment. Justin Blackman barely played Blaine Gabbert, Tyson, Alualu, Eugene Monroe, Derek Harvey. I mean, Mercedes Lewis's best years came as a blocking tight end in green Bay where he found his niche. Mercedes Lewis is just super version of Lee Smith. And they drafted him in the first round. So the Jaguars have historically struggled by getting value for getting value out of their first round picks and being able to hit on Josh Allen is a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. And they, and they definitely hit like, um, that guy's lights out. And, you know, there, there was some there was some uh, some hate. I got to I got to throw salt on my guy, Nate Geary, who's going to be with you Friday night on uh, Food for Thought uh, last Saturday at the chop up the live show that we did. 
he's like, oh, who is this guy? He's not even enough. like, and he was he was really throwing it on him. I think Josh Allen let you know who he was, man. Nate, you're gonna have to put some respect on Josh Allen's name down there in Jacksonville. It it, it was not a it was not a pretty picture for us. But all right, moving on, moving on. So that way we can um we get let's talk a little bit around about around the league. Um, if you don't mind, I know we didn't quite prepare for this, uh, so I won't ask anything that's too in depth, but just, just a couple of opinion questions for you real quick. Uh, so first, uh, Derek Henry, um, I didn't, I haven't had a chance to really talk to you. We used to, we used to chat it up almost every single day, Bruce. I feel like I barely talk to you anymore, man. Like, I don't know. Did I do something? You mad at me? No, no, I, I'm just busy, man. I can barely function. <laughs> I'm, I'm joking because I'm the you know, same funny. Way. Joe like, Marino barely... said very said something very similar to me not too long ago. He was like, man, I feel like our, our chat just kind of went dead on me. It's like, it's not, it's not you. It's me. Like it's not you. It's, it's like me. God. As George Costanza would say, you can't say it's not you, it's me. I invented it's not you, it's me. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> That's a great... Anyway, anyway, because I, I, we can get off on tangents and I can talk quotes and movies and, and shows and all that stuff. But I feel like um, Derek Henry, uh, so his injury, it, it completely changed the landscape of what, I, at least I assume, what we can expect from the AFC because it changes who Tennessee is as a team. Even though they still won Sunday, I think it completely changes um, what we see. As far as I'm not going to talk about the the landscape of the the conferences or anything like that right now, but just from the standpoint of running backs, we already talked about Devin and we talked about Zach. Um, I think coming into this year and then obviously up until his injury, Derrick Henry we ha he has to be hands down the best back in the league, right? Or, or am I kind of tripping when I say that? I think that even before his injury, Derrick Henry was much more of a volume back. He is extremely talented, but as far as efficiency goes, he was never the most efficient back in the league. Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, Alvin Kamara's ability to contribute in the pass game, I think matters a lot. Um, Derek Henry is a great back. And I think Derek Henry will be a hall of famer when you are that good for that long. That's a hall of fame career. I think he's a hall of fame running back. I think he's every bit Adrian Peterson. That's what I do. Okay. I think he's every bit Adrian Peterson. And I think that people don't necessarily quite give him as many flowers as Adrian Peterson got during his time. But I think he's every bit as good as Adrian Peterson was. So when it looked, when I look at Derrick Henry and you lose a back of that caliber, I do think he was starting to run into issues before this. The okay. efficiency level was not there. Yards per carry were down. He, he was not quite as good as he's been. And a lot of people think, listen, when you have that many touches – eventually it's going to happen. Like there's, there's, you, you can't, you cannot escape father time forever. And you can't escape the wear that those touches have on your body forever. A lot of people in the fantasy football community have the rule of 370, which is the year after you have 370 more touches is usually the year when you start to fall off. This was of course popularized by Larry Johnson from the chiefs who had one really huge year. We got a bajillion touches and then was never heard from again, essentially, because of the wear that those kind of things take on your body. Now, obviously, there's nothing magical about 370. It's not like if you have 369 touches, you're going to have a real nice year. But if you have 370, then you're screwed. Like, that's not how this works. But it's a rule of thumb in relates to how much those touches can wear on you. So I think Derrick Henry was starting to kind of decline a little bit. Anyway, which is amazing because I thought it was going to happen two years ago. So props to him for maintaining that level of touches. But he's still an elite back. He's still a good back. And it still changes things. I don't think the Titans won. I don't think the Titans beat the Rams because Tannehill proved he can be the focal point of a team. Because I don't think they won it because of their offense. They won it because of their defense. So yeah. the whole, can the Titans be the Titans without Derrick Henry? I still don't think that question has been answered. They had an impressive win against the Rams, but I still don't think that question has been answered. I'll wait a little bit on that. Okay. Well, where I was going with the question um, is more so, so now that he's out of the picture, and I know Christian McCaffrey is kind of working his, his way back into game shape and he's, and he's back, but um, where do you see, like who's wearing the crown at this point? I know you mentioned Alvin Kamara. Who do you see is wearing the crown as a running back to that's that's in the league right now jonathan taylor yeah yeah, yeah. jonathan taylor absolutely yeah. i'm glad you said it yeah jonathan taylor is my dude right john i was i i am a i am a card carrying member of 
team do nothing at running back. Mm -hmm. I, of all people, two years ago, was flat out saying that if the Bills wanted to draft Jonathan Taylor at 41, I was down. I flat out said, if J.K. Dobbins, Jonathan Taylor, if they're there, I'm good with it. I'm completely fine with it. It's as high as I've ever been like, yeah, sure, let's draft a running back. (laughs) That was as high as ever because I love that running back class. I thought they were great. And I just did not understand why there was going to be None of them in the first round. Now, great. I wasn't going to take him in the first round. We know this already. We know how Bruce feels about running backs in the first round. But the fact that the first one didn't go until 32 and it was Clyde Edwards-Alaire was shocking to me. I think that Jonathan Taylor and J.K. Dobbins were both better prospects than Najee Harris and Travis Etienne. But it's got to line up right. You got to have the right team with the right mentality who thinks, sure, I'll be an exception to the rule. And they draft a running back in the fir- in the first round. And that year, you just didn't have it. But for me, Jonathan Taylor, he's the dude. He is that guy. Yeah, I love Jonathan. So Jonathan Taylor, for me, is um, he's I don't feel like it's sneaky anymore because obviously he's he's been putting up some big numbers these last couple of weeks. But I feel like he's been flying under the radar when it comes to um, just appreciation around the league. I f- you know, and obviously it's because of Christian McCaffrey and uh, Dalvin Cook and, and and Henry and all these other guys we're talking about. I don't feel like there have been enough people talking about Jonathan Taylor. Without Jonathan Taylor last year, I don't think they make the playoffs. Without Jonathan Taylor this year, I don't think they're anywhere as good as they are. You know, like Carson Wentz is a, you know, he, he's there, but there's no way that that team is is decent without Jonathan Taylor, man, at all. I agree with you. Uh, Carson Wentz has been not as bad as last year. That's what I'll say about Carson Wentz. He's been not as bad as last year. But to be fair, he was one of the worst quarterbacks in football last year. Yeah. So I think the last time I did QB stew, he was right in the middle. He was, he was okay. He was fine, which quite frankly, I would take that as a win. If I'm Indianapolis, given what there was a chance I was getting from Carson Wentz, but now they have to be worried about quarterback purgatory. Now they have to be worried that Carson Wentz is going to play just well enough that they're not in position to pick a quarterback, but not poorly enough that they can be in a really good position to pick a quarterback. But also now he plays enough that they have to give the Eagles a first-round pick because of snap count. So that really puts them in a weird spot. What if Carson Wentz is good enough and the Colts are in a playoff position where they have to play him because they're in they're in the run for the playoffs, but he's not quite good enough that they feel really good about at the end of the year. Then they're in this weird sort of quarterback purgatory, and you might as well have just – use your pick and trade it up and got a guy. You know what I mean? So Mm -hmm. the Colts are going to be very, very interesting for me to look at because I think that the remainder of team on the Colts is really good. I think their defense has struggled a little bit. I think Matt Eberflus, who is uh, kind of a popular head coaching candidate for a lot of years, the, the shine is starting to come off Eberflus just a little bit. And people are starting to criticize a little bit of the Colts defense. Darius Leonard has been banged up a little bit, but I think that there's a good remainder of team there, but if you can't get the quarterback position right, I don't know how far you're going to go. Yeah, and and I think um, that's that's been the issue really since, and I know, you know, how the team, how it's gone out there in Indiana. I lived in Indianapolis for some time, so, you know, it's Peyton country, and then after Peyton, uh, you know, they draft this stud of a quarterback, and then now he gets injured and retires early. Then you have, um, you know, a guy that is a seat filler for a little bit. Now he's down in Miami, and now all of a sudden you got – um, you know, Carson Wentz, he's supposed to be the savior, but he's just not that guy. He's not that guy. So I think they're, they're going to be looking in a draft again for a quarterback very soon. In my opinion, I could be wrong. They, they, you know, Carson, uh, is costing some money there, but I, I tell you what, I, I don't care about the money. It's, it's about wins. And I don't think Carson is the guy to bring them, but enough about the Colts. We got, we got 20 minutes. So let's, let's do this, man. Um, going into Sunday, going against the Jersey Jets, man, what do you, do you think the game plan is going to kind of typically be like, OK, let's get out there, let's let's air this thing out? Or do you think they're going to try to figure out based on McDiddy's comments? Do you think they're going to try to fix the running game or do you think they're going to like just say, you know what, let's just let's go lay the smack down on these boys because we really need we need a win. I would be absolutely shocked if the Buffalo Bills came out and threw 14 times in a row. I'd be absolutely shocked if they did that. Sean McDermott has made it a point over and over and over again this year. One of the overarching messages of this year has been, you got to be two-dimensional as an offense. 
you got to be two dimensional. Now we can make an entirely separate pot on whether or not he's actually right. And you actually do need to be two dimensional as a team, but he says, you absolutely have to be. So for me, I would be shocked, absolutely shocked that the Buffalo bills would have, would come out and throw 14 times in a row. I just, I'd be floored. I think that there's a reasonable chance you see, and I, this is a spoiler for the Bruce exclusive for tomorrow, just so you know, but I think we see a lot more under center from Josh Allen. I think you see a lot more boot action from Josh Allen. I think you see things that will give him depth from the line of scrimmage and put him on the edge specifically to his right to be able to have high, low concepts and also threaten the defense with his legs. I think that there's a chance you see modified Sean McVay, Jared Goff hmm. offense. What Sean McVay made famous, which is a lot of people moving against the grain, misdirection, boot action, all that stuff like that. The difference is with that stuff and Josh Allen, you have a lot more on your plate than with that stuff and Jared Goff because right. Josh Allen has traits that Jared Goff dreams about when he goes to sleep at night and he imagines that he's a superhero. He imagines he's Josh Allen. That's the way it works. Jared's like, I'm going to take off my glasses and I'm going to pull open my dress shirt and it's going to be Josh Allen. I'm sitting here making fun of Josh, like Jared Goff, like he's not a multimillionaire who's dating a supermodel. But the fact of the matter is that <laughs> you can do a lot of things with Josh Allen in that offensive style that you can't do with Jared Goff. So I would be shocked if we threw the ball a lot, but I wouldn't be shocked if we saw a lot more under center stuff, if we saw a lot more jet sweep and jet motion stuff, and you saw a lot more boot action. I'll tell you what, though, Bruce, uh, I know you just kind of like got yourself for saying like I'm making fun of a multimillionaire who dates a superstar. But listen, Peyton Manning's son wears Josh Allen's name on his jersey. So I'm just saying, I think Jared mm -hmm. Goff can absolutely catch these jokes. That's all. <laughs> that's all I'm saying. Uh, but he so I agree him. with you, though. I think, yeah, he can afford him. He, he can take him. <laughs> but uh, so you're talking. So you, you, you'd be shocked if, if they just come out and completely just try to air it out. Um, so, well, let me ask you on the flip. Uh, the the co the coach came out and said that Mike is it Mike White. I always I, I keep wanting yes. to say Mike Jones. I'm a hip hop Mike fan, White. and it, it I'm sorry, Mike Jones just sticks in my head. Uh, Mike White will be starting at quarterback Sunday. Um, I saw a couple things out of him. The couple games that you know he was in there in front last week, the the little bit that he was in there on the touchdown throw that drive. Um, he looks like a competent NFL quarterback. Is, is there anything that we have to worry about this week with him? Do you think it's just one of those things like, yeah, he looked good in, the, you know, in that situation, but it's nothing for the Bills to really worry about. I want to see them make him throw the ball down the field. Mike White has an average distance of target of a little over six yards. It's unbelievably close. We, we tease Trent Edwards for being captain check down, but the fact of the matter is that Mike White is not throwing the ball downfield. He's not pushing the ball on the field. And the thing is, it's almost like the Bills will need to break character to make sure that they're game planning for Mike White. That's one of the things I'm looking for this week mm -hmm. against the Jets is, are the Bills willing to break character? Are the Bills willing to say, listen, a lot of this defense is built around the idea we're not going to give up the deep ball, right? But Mike White has shown already in his limited amount of times, he doesn't care about the deep ball. He will put the ball in reasonable places for his running backs to be able to catch the ball in the backfield and get five and six yards at a time. Mike White threw for over 400 yards and didn't at one point attempt a pass that was 15 yards down the field. <laughs> Not completed it, didn't even try. <laughs> this like, guy literally that. dink and dunked his way to 400 <laughs> yards. So patience is is not his problem. So if you keep thinking that he's going to be impatient and he's going to eventually throw the ball into too deep coverage, no newsflash, he's not going to. Spoiler alert, he's sitting there going, man, I'm on borrowed time. I'm a backup from Western Kentucky. I'm going to keep checking it down to my running backs until the cows come home and you can come up and make him come up and stop me. So I really want to see the Buffalo Bills compress Mike White. I want to see them dare him to throw the ball down the field. I would love to see a lot more single high from the Bills and say, you know what? Throw the ball down the field. See if Elijah Moore and Corey Davis can take the top, top off of us. Because I don't think you want to, Mike White. I don't think you have the desire to do that. So for me, make him take that shot. Make him hold the ball. Let us see how he does.
Now, is there a little bit of concern as far as so with this game um, outside looking in? And I know I'm all over the place in a way because I'm asking you about the quarterback play. Um, but is there is there any concern on your part when you're looking at this like, OK, maybe the loss that we just had against the Jaguars gives this Jets team a little bit of confidence that they can actually hang with us. Um, is that is that anything that that is a concern for you or is it really one of those things still where it's like, OK, well, you still everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. So you still got to come and beat the Buffalo Bills. Um, where, where are you at right now with the matchup? If you were the head coach of the Jets and you were facing the Buffalo Bills this week, would part of the messaging to you be, be to your team is that we can absolutely beat these people. We beat the Titans and the Titans beat them. They lost the Jaguars. There's no reason we can't beat the Buffalo Bills. This idea that the Buffalo Bills are some sort of godlike team that can't be stopped, that a lot of people thought, oh, this is the best team in the NFL. They came out and they shut out a bunch of teams. They played really well. They were dominating 35 to nothing, 40 to nothing. That's not that team anymore. That aura of that Buffalo Bills team is dead. It's gone. So if you were the head coach, you'd be using it, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'd be shocked if they weren't too. Yeah. And it, and and then, so now back to the quarter, because it was kind of leading to that. So it's like, obviously, um, they, they spent the first round draft pick this year on a quarterback. Injuries and all this other stuff that happens gets us here to where we have Mike White. Um, the coach doesn't necessarily sing the high praises of his of his first dra round draft pick. Are we are we looking now at a possible um, quarterback controversy in Jersey, or is it you know is it still going to be you know like, how do you, how do you see that playing out? This is the best case scenario for the New York Jets. Absolutely, the best case scenario. You have okay. a built in excuse to not play Zach this week. Built in excuse. He's not, he's not ready. He's hurt. And you don't have to worry about exposing him to a really good defense this week. So if Mike mm -hmm. White plays well against the Bills and the Jets win, you can deal with this next week. If Mike White doesn't play well, it's a built-in excuse for you to, you to insert Zach Wilson back into the lineup. You absolutely have that ability to be able to just built in excuse. The, if you have the ability to let the narrative write itself and take care of it for you, and you don't have to worry about running counterculture to the narrative, you let that happen. So it's perfect storm for the New York Jets to be able to get a look at Mike White against a good defense and not have to expose Zach Wilson to him. And if he plays really well, great. You can deal with that next week. And if he plays really poorly, oh, well, you know, good thing Zach's healthy now. And you can put him right back in and nobody has to worry about there being an uprising for Mike White. I think, I guess for me, the concerning, and it's not concerning because I'm a Bills fan first, uh, but the concerning part about the conversation is like when they're like, well, hey, well, I think one of the reporters asked him like, well, uh, Mike White looked really good. Is Mike White possibly your starter going forward? And he's like, well, anything's possible. And then he even had another shot where he's like, well, we see two quarterbacks uh, who look good and competent in this system, and you just have to be patient and take what the defense gives you and blah, blah, blah. Like it felt more like shots, like, you know, like one of those like, well, yeah, obviously I know what I'm doing. This rookie guy doesn't know what he's doing. You know, is that how you're reading that as well? Or is it just uh, me and the rest of the media kind of over reading into that? I think it's Robert Sala not having his coach speak down yet. OK, that's what I think. <laughs> Sometimes these new coaches are a little bit too honest because they don't necessarily realize that a little bit of their misspeak can generate an entire narrative. Look at last year. Last year, when Sean McDermott kind of awkwardly stumbled through the why Mitch Morse isn't playing discussion against the Cardinals, mm -hmm. that generated his entire narrative that we were going to cut Mitch Morse and John Feliciano was going to take it over center, all because Sean McDermott fumbled his way awkwardly through a press conference. Head coaches tell you nothing because the second they tell you something, it gets spun. That's the reason why. That's why they tell you nothing. That's why you have coach speak. Coach speak exists because they don't want to deal with it because then they have to backtrack on their statement have to qualify their previous statements. And then they spend their entire press conference trying to deal with the crap they said last press conference. Mm -hmm. And so Robert Saylor just hasn't quite figured it out yet. Next time when he asks, he'll say things like Zach is our starting quarterback. 
<laughs> that's what he'll say. And he'll have no yeah. personality and the joy will be sucked out of him <laughs> because that's the way it works. It's a little bit like a freshman at college versus a senior at college. You look at the freshman at college and they're like, yeah, boy, let's go. Let's go to a party. Friday night's going to be great. You look at that senior at college, that same party, they're running around. They haven't showered in two days. They're still wearing their sweats. They got toothpaste <laughs> on their shirt. They're like, I just want to get the heck out of here. That's the way it is for NFL head coaches. You know what? That made me think about Rex. And I don't know why I think about Rex because I'm not a Rex fan. But like same thing when he got to Buffalo that first year, like the first presser, he's like talking major. And but and you can tell like towards the end of it, he's just like coming to the podium. And he's like, yeah, so, you know, it's, the best. It's, it's Buffalo Bills football, baby. It's like all the energy and, you know, the energy we're used to Rex having, like it's just all gone. But it, it's like that with coaches in general, like when things don't go the right way. And um, I, I just feel like for, for Rob, out there man it's a rough situation it's a rough situation and and i don't i don't know what the i don't know what to take from it i don't know what to expect over the next couple of years if they're even patient with them because it seems like from from what we've seen uh they're not exactly the most patient with their coaches either i think they were a little too patient with the last one i, I don't think but but still I, it just doesn't seem like coaches get the opportunity that like sean mcdermott got with the bills you don't get um two years of bad quarterback play you know, and, and sorry, Buffalo Bills fans, Josh Allen wasn't good his rookie year. He, he improved a little bit his second year, but it wasn't good play. And Sean McDermott got that. He got patience and he was able to to still develop. Him. And that's just not what I get from the Jets. So I just I don't know, man. I, I think that um, this Sunday I'm looking forward to the Bills coming in. And it, just so you know, Bruce, this is the part of the time where we uh, always migrate to our our hot takes and our score predictions and all that stuff oh. so that's kind of where i was going i was just there with that um but yeah this sunday i'm looking forward to to seeing the bills uh confuse mike i, I want to see mike white be completely confused i want to see um you know i want to see this defense continue to be dominant but i want to see the offense come out and be pissed off i, I that you can see them i want to see them try to completely destroy this defense um i'm expecting a, a is it third down where you are bruce is it third down uh yeah it's always third down i heard <laughs> i heard it's i heard the, uh, the horns i'm like oh it's third down let's get it but yeah no that's what i'm looking forward to so um I'm going to go with the in the comments. Let me know what you think the score is going to be. I don't expect Bruce to have one unless you want to throw one out there, man. But I'm, I'm thinking the Bills are going to go. Um, I'm thinking more is going to be like 31 to 13. Where are you at with it this week? Like not necessarily with a score, but do you think that that makes sense? You think that that sounds like it might be the case? I will go 24, 13 Bills. 24, 13. Okay. All right. And, and, where do you, you know, how do you see that coming about? Do you see that being more, obviously it's a lower scoring compared to what we would want to see from the Bills offense. So you think it's going to be a defensive game Sunday? I think it's halfway between the Bills offense is totally back and the Bills offense is gone. I just don't think it's going to be quite that simple. I don't think it's going to be, okay, you know what? This was the get right game. For the Bills, everything's fine. They dropped a 50 burger. All is forgiven. Everyone's genius now. Brandon Bean's the greatest person in the world. Brian Dable's amazing. That's just the way it goes. I, I don't think that's going to be the case by any means. But I also don't think it's going to be we drop six points on the Jaguars. I think it's, again, it's going to be somewhere in between. Well, what about Charlie? He says Jets 16, Bills 13. What do you think about that? <laughs> I, I think that it would be a replication of the Bills Jaguars game. I think if Charlie's prediction were to come to pass, then I think that you see the same game you saw against the Jaguars replicated. And I think mm -hmm. that's I think that's a little bit unlikely because we don't see things like that happen very often. You don't see scenarios where you have the identical game happen back to back. So for me, that game would look basically the same as the game we just saw. And I don't mm. think you're going to have two identical games. Now, I'm not saying it's going to be a bounce back and they're going to you know, drop 70 points on the Jets, but it seems unlikely they would have both. I agree. I, I I don't think, um, and, and this is obviously not a shout at Charlie. Charlie's my guy. Um, I, I don't, I don't think 
I don't think it's going to be that, Charlie. Uh, and, and not because I want to underestimate the Jets or because I want to overestimate the Bills. Uh, but what I think we're going to see um, is kind of what Bruce has been saying all night. It's one of those things where, A, um, from the beginning of this episode, we talked about how uh, there is a completely different vibe in one Bill's drive right now. Um, there is business like it's business minded. These guys are here to work now and not that they weren't before, but it's, it was one of those things where they knew they were they knew they were good. They knew they were on fire. They were, you know, and they were playing teams that were inferior. So I feel like it was a little bit lighter of a mood. I feel like it was a little bit like, you know, look. We could beat these guys. And then they got they got punched in the mouth. So I think now, you know, what happens when you get embarrassed? Uh, you know, when I was coming up in school, you get in a fight, you get beat in a fight. You come back with a with a vengeance, man. And I, I feel like I, I don't think it's going to be uh, the, the 48 to 10 scores or the 45 to nothing. You know, I'm not necessarily going that far. But I don't I'm not sure that I feel like the Jets have what it takes to really punch us in the mouth after this. Now, if this was the if this was the trap game, if it wasn't the Jaguars, say the Bills would have beat the Jaguars, you know, 35 to 10. And then they were still riding high like, yeah, we got it. We're doing this. I could see this being a trap game. But at this point, I feel like and, and I'm not sure who said it earlier, but I feel like this gives me very very similar feeling to what I had after we lost against the Arizona Cardinals last season. Um, completely different situation, completely different type of game. The, the offense moved the ball that game. They scored. So it's not the same. But when you're looking at this and you're talking about like the Jets beating the Bills, there's just no way that I see it happening. And I'll gladly be like, if I'm wrong, hey, you know, I, I'm, I'm one that always I'll come and admit it, but I just don't see it. I really don't see it. No, I agree with you. And uh, Charlie's in the comments says, uh, you can be honest, Bruce. Okay, I'm always honest. I get <laughs> yeah, yeah. I get in a lot of trouble because of my honest. Now I make sure that I I word my honesty in such a way that people understand where I'm coming from because I don't want to be you know, I want to be honest, but I don't want to be a shock jock. Right? I don't want to yeah. say things to try and get a responsiveness. I think one of the important things about this responsibility is that you always take the opportunity to explain yourself and that you right. say why. You don't just throw conclusions out there in the hopes that you will get people to respond, but right? you're not trying to be inflammatory. So if you really believe something, then you should be able to take the time and explain it. And so I hope that I'm able to do that here, but there have been more than a few times when I've gotten in a little bit of trouble right, uh, for not necessarily conforming to public opinion. And that's one of the reasons why I feel the need to do podcasts like in the off season where I said, did an entire podcast on logical fallacies and how the, you think you know more than the team is the dumbest response in the world. And if you say it, you should stop saying it because it's fallacious. So I think that being honest is important. And I think being honest with yourself is important. I think one of the reasons that the bills are in this situation is they weren't honest with themselves about what they had in Feliciano and what they had in Cody Ford. I was not on board with signing John Feliciano. I said it before he resigned. I said, if I was me, I would not resign John Feliciano. I think he's a eh player, right? He's a eh mm -hmm. player, and I don't think I would resign a eh player. Now, the, the more details came out about his contract, the more on board I was because it's really not an expensive contract at all. He could easily be a backup at that contract. So that makes it a little bit better for me. I was all on board with drafting an interior offensive lineman high. So when you have these takes ahead of time, you've earned the ability to be able to say, hey, I'm not being a contrarian. I thought these things before they made the maneuver. So... I think that's an important part of being honest, and it's part of what we're trying to be ourselves, and it's probably what teams need to be with themselves. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm with you. I'm with you. And I, it, it took me a minute when I first started doing the podcasting to um, kind of understand that and find that balance. But, you know, uh, joining Buffalo Rumblings has definitely helped me kind of develop into a better, um, I guess, deliver er of of takes and everything so uh i appreciate you for that bruce i feel like you you actually helped me develop in this role so i i, I want to publicly I, I know i say it to you all the time but man i want to publicly thank you for for helping me become a better interviewer and a better uh podcast host and whatever other term i can use to to describe what we do just so everybody knows i literally did nothing he's giving me undeserved flowers right now see, i have see. nothing to do with anything like this when you have talent <laughs> I just literally get to just sit by and just kind of watch it. And then I get to take credit for all of it after it's grown. It's a little bit like uh, a farmer who has an irrigation system built in, right? And he has 
the somebody else do all the tilling for him, and then he goes, "Look at what I grew." It's like you didn't grow anything. You your, paid someone your else analogies, to dude. Your analogies are always on point, but you got to give yourself more credit because I'm trying to get you. You honestly did help me a ton. And for those of you who believe Bruce over me right now, I'm so disappointed in you because Bruce has absolutely helped me. <laughs> so whatever. I never lie, Spence. <laughs> you I'm just the, said I am the beacon right. and bastion of truth. Well, look, before we get out of here, uh, first, I want to thank Bruce. Uh, but before I, I, I uh, not allow, but before I ask Bruce to kind of um, let everybody know where to find his content and to and what to look for coming up, I do want to shout out my guy, the market dominator, John Spashek. Let me tell you, not only do I want to shout him out because he's a, a great sponsor in front of the show, but I want to shout him out because Saturday night we did something great in Buffalo. In, on Saturday night, man. And if you weren't there, I feel bad for you. But the Buffalo Rumblings IPA was released and we had a great time. And John was there with energy. BNMC was there with energy. We had the Buffalo or the Bills Mafia Babes there with energy. But John Spashak was one of the main guys who he got up, he got on the mic and he gave some hot takes and he, he talked a lot about some things. So if you're looking for a mortgage or not a mortgage, you're looking for a home, which comes with a mortgage, be sure to hit my guy, John Spastak, up. We got his number right down there in the corner, 716-570-32. Is that 98? Yeah, 3298. Hit my guy, John, up, and I'm telling you, you will not be disappointed. He's he's the top guy, and he's the best guy out there, like bar none. So, Bruce, why don't you let everybody know where they can find you, what you got coming up, what what great show. Uh, you and Nate uh, have one coming up again this week as well. Let everybody know what's going on. Well, tomorrow, if you're watching this live, tomorrow – my most recent episode of the Bruce exclusive will drop on the Buffalo rumblings podcast network. Every Friday night, Nate Geary hosts a sports talk Saturday and the Buffalo bills pre and post game shows on WGR 550. And I do a show together called food for thought where we relax after a long way, a long week of work and we crack open a beer and we talk about food and football. And we combine as we like to joke around two of our three favorite F words, food and football. Um, the third one obviously being, you know, farts and fart jokes. So that's clearly the case. So, uh, you can find me on yeah. Twitter and Instagram at Bruce exclusive. Twitter is where you'll get the takes. Instagram is where you will get pictures of food and dogs. I make no promises for anything else. So thank you so much for having me, Spence. Thank you for being a part of this for everyone in the comments. We appreciate you. We love you. You guys have been unbelievable. We have quintupled the amount of subscribers to the YouTube channel that Buffalo Rumblings has in the last couple of months. And that is a testament to you guys being gracious enough to bring us into your homes and bring us into your Wednesday evenings and your Friday evenings. Thank you so much. If you have not done so already, make sure you like, subscribe, comment, rate, review, share the show. Thank you so much for everything you do. We appreciate it. Do all of that. Do all of that. And one more time, I just want to make sure I, I show this and tell you again, go out to Wegmans, go out to consumers and get the Buffalo Rumblings IPA. It's it's actually I don't drink beer, but I drank like a ton of them. Actually pretty good. So get out there, support. The money goes to the Haven House of Buffalo. Uh, the Haven House of Buffalo specializes in taking care of women and children escaping domestic violence situations. So it's a it's for a good cause and it tastes good. And, you know, you get to be cool like Bruce and Spence. Like, we drink this stuff. So it's going to be, you get to be like us. No, joking on that. But please go support. Go do it. Uh, Buffalo Rumblings, we all love you over here. You already know how I do it. Take care of each other. Love each other and live in peace. And as always, stay positive. Test negative. Go Bills. You got to say it, Bruce. Oh, you're muted. Come on. Go, Bruce. Uh, go Bills. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs>